I'm Drew Taylor, and welcome into another season of Valpo Sports Night here on VU TV. My guest today, Andrew Stem, WVUR Sports Broadcaster, and Colin Taro, VU TV Assistant Sports Director. We have a lot to cover, so let's dive right in, guys. The Valpo football team suffered a tough loss over the weekend. Uh, that might be an understatement. Uh, <laughs> at the hands of the Youngstown State Penguins. Uh, that puts their record at 0-2. I know it's early, but give me your evaluation of this team so far. Uh, you know, the St. Joe loss to start off the season was a tough, tough loss. You lose the game with 23 seconds left to go. You know, you allow them to drive 90-some yards all the way down when the defense just need to shore up a stop. You know, a, a win in the first game would have been nice to see, especially, you know, the tough series and Set seasons that we've had. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, playing Youngstown, that was just, you can't allow 21 points in the first five minutes, you right. know, off the fumble recovery, the block punt. It's just stuff like that can't be allowed to happen. It's going to be a, a, another tough year, hopefully, but, I mean, not hopefully. It's Hopefully you, you see some improvement right. over the one one loss or one win season last year. You know, you want to see more, more, even if it's not more wins, more steps in the right direction. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to see them, you know, maybe stop that defense right. and just make improvements along the way. And I think they're starting to do that a little they bit. They played very good three, three and a half quarters. Yeah. They sure did. I mean, on Thursday night, I was very impressed with their week one performance, yeah. obviously besides the end of the, end of the game scoreboard. Yeah. So. I, I do feel that you're seeing a lot of improvement. Taking a look, just even comparing the season opener a year ago right. when they lost 41-35 to Franklin, a Division three school without any scholarships. Then yeah. they come down. A similar type loss to St. Joe's, but St. Joe's Division two they do give some athletic scholarships, so a different sort of caliber of player coming in. Um, not quite on the level of Grand Valley and things like that, some of your upper echelon Division two programs, but still football scholarships coming in and uh, you know Dale Carlson's squad hung right there in the end. The offense looks much smoother. Gabe Aliel has been very, very solid through the first couple of games. And uh, you know, Colin mentioned it, you kind of needed to set the tone with that win because in the next three games, they already talked about Youngstown, but then you got Duquesne coming up. Duquesne gives some athletic scholarships as well, the PFL being one of the few conferences that doesn't give football scholarships. And then uh, you open with PFL Power San Diego. So it was kind of built towards, really needed to win that St. Joe's game. So kind of hurt the morale, I think, of the team a little bit in that way because now they're certainly looking at probably an 0-4 start. Yeah. But they've seen a lot of improvements, and as those things kind of continue to happen, the offense continues to be more smoothly, the defense able to pick up a few more stops. They're kind of building towards something once they get into the middle of PFL play. And uh, I think a real good shot to knock off Butler at homecoming and then kind of springboard from that into the rest of October and November. You mentioned the schedule. Now the Pioneer Football League schedule is kind of set in stone. That's been determined for a while. But do you have a problem with the non-conference scheduling? We mentioned St. Joe's. Then you go to a Youngstown State team that, like you said, has 40 scholarships, beat Pittsburgh week one. Mm -hmm. Do you have a problem with sort of this parity in the non-conference scheduling? You know, I think not only the PFL next year is going to get an automatic bid into the FCS playoffs, and there was a, a league-wide sort of commitment to try and toughen up the schedule a little bit because you see before that, uh, the FCS non-scholarships are basically Division three schools that can't play Division three football. So there was an effort to schedule a lot of those Division three schools. And now more along the lines, you've seen the conference sort of step up their scheduling as a whole. And, uh, you know, I think when you ultimately want to compete with teams like Youngstown for the national championship and things like that, you do need to kind of up your schedule a little bit and sort of see what those teams are like now in terms of consistently playing those maybe it would be a little bit better if the Crusaders would start with someone maybe on the lower echelon of FCS that give away football scholarships and kind of build up toward teams like Youngstown in the top 10 a team would be Pitt I mean, in their tough. opening week um, you know and it's a game like that where you kind of go in and just hope nobody gets hurt so for the rest of the season you, right. you would like to compete and win but realistically you're looking at we just don't want to get anybody hurt so we can carry on with the rest of the season but you know there are teams like Indiana State right. and there are other teams in the area who are a little bit lacking what Youngstown State is quite not quite at the upper echelon of that and you kind of build and start playing those teams and then sure. once you see you can compete then you can sort of start to build in and play some of those upper echelon teams in the FCS. Um, quickly before we move on to the next topic, wins this season, what do you guys think? How many? I want to say three or four, but... You, Leave you your just, heart out of this. Just, what, do you, what do you think? I think probably two or three games. Okay. I'll take three. I think they get Butler, they get Moorhead, and either Campbell or Davidson, one of those two. Okay, so pick enough. up three. Uh, let's move on now to the Crusader volleyball team. Uh, it's coming off another 21 campaign last season. Uh, they currently sit at 5-6, and six, though, in this season. What needs to be improved before conference play hits later this month? I think realistically, they just need a little bit more consistency. You saw it last Tuesday at the Arc when they played Illinois State. They came out a little bit flat in that first set 
ended up falling, I think 25-19 or something like that. And then they kind of got things in gear and ended up winning pretty easily over the final three sets. And when you look at kind of how they've done at those tournaments, they'll play some tough competition. They've lost to teams like Iowa and Missouri. They lost to Moorhead State. And, uh, you know, they've been competitive losing sets 25-22 or something, but just can't quite get over the hump. And I think they're just looking for a little bit more consistency out of their frontline hitters, out of the setter as they get set for Horizon League play. But they've challenged themselves in the non-conference. They still have a trip coming up to Indiana here, I think, next weekend. And they're just kind of trying to get themselves ready, really, for the grind of the Horizon League. Haven't we been singing this song the last two years, though? I mean, talent-wise, I would argue they're the best in the Horizon League. It's just putting it together, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, it's... The non-conference play, you obviously you want to see the chemistry form. You want to right. see consistency like, see you, were, new like you were saying. Bring the table yeah, on. and I mean, you just want to be able to establish yourself before you go into non-conference. And at five and six, you know, it's it's a decent record. It's about 500. You know, they've mm -hmm. had some tough losses. They've had some close games. I mean, going to Indiana, what, this weekend, I believe, for their final one, is that's going to be, I mean, it's a Big Ten team. So it's a nice bar to set yourself at, especially with the talent that's here the talent that we believe can win the Horizon League. It's just you want to see consistency. You want to see the team come together and be able to, you know, just once the Horizon League comes, just bang out wins left and right. So, so you have like an NFL preseason approach. It's yeah. kind of like it's all relative. Yeah. As long as they get together before conference play, Eight. you're not worried about the early start. We want Obviously, we want to see better results than we had sure. the past couple of years. But, yeah, that's that's the way I kind of view at least the volleyball side of okay, it. Yeah. Fair enough. I mean, Karen Avery, you can't doubt her success. No, no, she's been no and I mean, you look at it, realistically, the Horizon League is going to be a one-bid conference. It's not, you're right. very rarely going to get somebody to come and get an at-large bid in the volleyball tournament. So just kind of work and take your lumps here going through the no difficult non-conference. Prepare yourselves for the conference tournament and the conference season. And then you want to be playing your best volleyball in November. One minute left before the break, guys. I want to move on quickly to the men's and women's soccer teams. Uh, their, both their programs have enjoyed recent success. Uh, but with that being said, which squad do you think has the best chance uh, to win the Horizon League title this year? I see the women, actually. Okay. Um, I think the women are a little bit hungrier. You know, they, they had a good year last year. They just didn't quite get there. They're 2-0 and right now. Mm -hmm. The men, they're 0-2, they're but it's been very close games. I just sure. think the women have a little bit better shot of doing okay. it. I will take the reverse approach and take the men only because they won the regular season title last year and therefore kind of had that taste of success. Mm -hmm. And this women's squad hasn't had that in the Horizon League yet. They had some success in the last decade in the mid-con, but they haven't quite gotten there yet. So look for them to have some success this year, but then next year really is when they can get going after having a taste of it to know what it takes to get there. I'm thinking the men just because they, they were so close last year. I mean, getting home field advantage throughout the Horizon League playoffs, all that, kind of a heartbreaking loss to end the season, but I think they're on the verge of, of doing some big things and making it to the NCAA tournament. Uh, on that note, when we come back, Colin and Andrew will tell you which rookie QB impressed them in week one. That and more next on Valpo Sports Night. I'm Rachel Bacher and I'm on BU TV. We're mock trial and we're on BU TV. We're a student alumni association and we're on BU TV. We're the Acapellas, we're on BU TV. I'm Dave Klein and I'm on BU TV. Lollipop, lollipop, lollipop. Say what we want, Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Only on VUTV. Valpo Sports Night, again joined by Colin Terrell, VU TV Assistant Sports Director, and Andrew Stem, WVUR Sports Broadcaster. Guys, some national topics now. There were several rookie quarterbacks who made their debut on Sunday with varying results, I might add. Uh, which one impressed you the most in week one? RG3. I mean, he, he, uh, that's the easy answer, but he had 
the best game by far. I mean, going up against the Saints team, which you really weren't knowing what to expect after a difficult offseason, to say the least. But just to have the game he had, to be able to prove that, you know, to show that Pierre Garçon can still help him out, he had a hell of a game. It's just one of those things where he clearly, by far, I, I don't know, I think, what, Andrew Luck had one touchdown. He yeah. threw a couple interceptions. Most of the other rookie QBs had a lot more interceptions than they sure. had touchdowns. Which is what rookie QBs should be doing. Yeah. I mean, they shouldn't be at the level of RG3, yeah. I don't think. That, that, Newton when he came in. Yeah, that game was an elite-level quarterback game coming out of a first-game rookie. Yeah, I, I can't really disagree with that at all. Uh, knowing what the Saints have done on defense to other quarterbacks in previous years, even you know without Jonathan Vilma playing, the performance that Griffin put in over 360 yards of total offense uh, was pretty darned impressive. And you look at some of the other rookie quarterbacks, and you kind of think, you know, rookies who come in, guys like Andrew Luck, he's coming into a team that was one in 15. You just kind of assume that they're going to be that sort of growing pains. And the Redskins, I think, won four or five games last year, maybe, even if that. So to kind of get that performance out of him, really unexpected, because you look at what's around him and you kind of go, especially with their running back situation, you know, not really naming a head guy. It looked like it was going to be Roy Hallou, and then it was going to be Evan Royster, and then it turned out to be Alfred Morris yesterday. So just kind of that running back situation in flux to get a guy to come in and be able to have this kind of success that he had right away. And really, you look at Pierre Garçon and not necessarily a number one receiver and kind of missing that and still being able to go through and have all the success he did says volumes about the type of player that Robert Griffin III is. Has there been too much pressure, though, in general, put on rookie QBs? It seems like in the 90s, maybe even the early 2000s, a quarterback got drafted, sat behind the starter for a couple years, then got into some live game action, you know, week or year two or three into their career. Um, we're seeing some growing pains, and I think sometimes we unfairly claim a quarterback right off the bat, they're, they're not going to be any good with the rest of their career. I think that's unfair, don't you guys? Yeah, well, and I think part of the problem you look at is that there's so much money involved. Uh, you're talking about guys sitting. There's a guy like, you know, a guy like Aaron right. Rodgers who goes late in the first round. They can afford to sit him behind Absolutely. Brett Favre because they're not paying $45, 50000000 million dollars guaranteed. I mean, we look at guys like Cam Newton and Matthew Stafford and they're being paid so much money, Sam Bradford's in the same boat, that you kind of have to throw them in, let them take their lumps, sure. and hope they don't get hurt behind what are probably weak offensive lines, and then just kind of get that experience that way. Two different schools of thought. You can either get the experience watching the veteran starter, or you can just be thrown to the fire, but I think a lot of it has to do with the amount of money that these guys are being paid and kind of the situations that they fall into. Rodgers fell into a great situation in Green Bay. Andrew Luck's going to have to you know, learn as he goes along and trying to evade the pressure that uh, is being brought up against the Indianapolis offensive line. Yeah, I think it's a hype train, too. I mean, if you go sure. back to the early 90s and, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, you didn't have the same kind of thing they have now. I mean, if you watch ESPN, it's, you know, they have the John Gruden quarterback <laughs> camp that's going on. And no, sure. it's just everyone, it, they kind of just shoved down your throat a little bit. Yeah. I feel that's unfair to them because if you have a, a bad, rough one or two seasons, you know, yeah. whereas back in the past that was, you know, all right, they're starting to grow. It's like, oh, they're a failure already. Let's right. draft someone new in the first round exactly. in season two. You know, they were, there was talk in St. Louis that they were going to do that with Sam Bradford, who's not really, you know, evolved quite to probably the, where they want to be. It's not a complete team yet. I mean, they didn't do that to him, but there was definitely talk about it until they traded the first round. Yeah. Same you know, deal pick. in Cleveland, taking yeah. Brandon Whedon after, you know, just a couple of years of Colt McCoy, Colt deciding McCoy, yeah. that maybe this isn't the direction right. we want to go, and the guy's had, you know, 25 games maybe to attempt mm -hmm. to prove himself. And yeah. It's a tough situation that they're putting in. Is that the media pressure? Is that the fan pressure? Like, you mentioned the money factor, which is a good one. I didn't even think of that. That you, how, do you, how do you explain to a fan base, uh, explain to the media that you're having – a guy who's making you know tens of million dollars a year, you drafted him first, second round pick, or you know things like that. How do you explain to them that oh we're going to sit him for a couple of years? There's a lot of impatient fans out yeah, there that want to see the future now. Absolutely, and I think you look to it. You know, coaching cycles are a lot different in the NFL. You know, you get to a college coach like we talk about Dell Carlson or something like that, and you know just a few wins in his first few years, but. College coaches generally given four or five years to get their whole recruiting so, yeah. cycle in, bring their players in, and then kind of evaluate where things are. Sure. But in the NFL, you know, with free agency and so many other things, that coaches don't have that luxury. So they're trying to win as soon as possible. Right. And if that means throwing the $60 million guy in front, you know, go ahead and do that. Or if it means drafting another quarterback because you're trying to save your job, right. that's sometimes what that means. And then you end up paying, you know, three quarterbacks on the roster, <laughs> yeah. combined $25 million or something like yeah. that. 
Uh, let's move on. It's been a while since we've talked about baseball on the show, which is my favorite thing to do. Uh, let's catch up the best we can. Uh, first, give me your surprise team that has seen some unpredictable success this year. Uh, the Washington Nationals. I know on one of the last shows of last season, I think I said that the <laughs> Nationals are going to be the team that doesn't hold up, but they have. Um, okay. I mean, you, you can at least admit it, though. Yeah, I, I, can, I can admit it. It's they've put together the success. They have great chemistry. You know, mm -hmm. just guys coming along and just developing how you would like to see someone do it. It's a, it's a perfect story of a team that's weak that built through their farm system that built through you know not going after maybe they did they did come up with you know a couple elite free agents but they they pieced it together and it's sure. truly one of those kind of old school baseball stories where right. it's a couple tough years but now they're finally seeing the success especially in a division that we thought was going to be unbelievably tough mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would like to agree with him, and I think, Colin, uh, that's a great pick. I'd also like to pick the Baltimore Orioles doing great things sure. in the AL East, but I'm going to go all the way out west, take a look at the Oakland Athletics. You talk about sure. a team building through drafting and through their farm system. Yeah, they went out and signed Cespedes, but other than that, giving him the $10 million, everybody was talking about Anaheim and Texas at the beginning of the year, and it was basically those two, and Oakland and Seattle were just kind of left in the dust. You know, Seattle is building towards something, but nobody really talked about Oakland and sort of what they could do and, and what they've done. They traded for Brandon Inch. He's just gone out. But, you know, with guys like Jared Parker and Brandon McCarthy has had a resurgence season until he went down the other day. And just kind of doing it, building it around those guys and still for that team with that minuscule payroll to be mm -hmm. in the middle of a wild card spot here in early September, uh, what has been going on in Oakland is pretty impressive. Do you think this is yeah. good for Major League Baseball to see sort of this turnover? You see the Pirates contending. Uh, you mentioned the Orioles. I mean, teams like this that don't normally see postseason action, at least in recent recent memory. Uh, the Yankees and Red Sox, Red Sox are out of it. Yankees might even fall out of the playoff ranks as well. Is this good for Major League Baseball? Oh, absolutely, I think it is. You look at the NFL, and the NFL being one of the, the most popular sport in America, sure. and people love the parody that reigns with it and how any season, any team can go from being the depth, the depth of the league to all of a sudden being up at the top. I mean, you look at like the Lions, and a few years ago they were 0-16. Last year they made the playoffs, and it doesn't take that long to do that, to make that change, and people are very excited about, you know, my team can get to the Super Bowl yeah. this year. There's a realistic chance, and I think that's something that baseball needs to capitalize on and say, you know, with this revenue sharing, increase things, with this second wild card spot, now all of a sudden, a third of each team, each league is going to get into the playoffs next year when the Astros right. flip over and they're 15 and 15. And there really is that chance that our team can go out with one free agent signing or a couple of good draft classes and contend and try and win the World Series. And I don't think that was the case 15 years ago. Yeah, you mentioned parity, and I mean, I, I love it personally. The networks might not love it because <laughs> you know, when the Yankees and the Red Sox aren't there, it's you know that's money lost to them. But you're seeing new players that you wouldn't see before in the national stage. You're seeing new rivalries. It's, it's exciting to see new teams. It's fresh. It, it mixes things up instead of the same old, same old year after year. You know what I say to the networks, though? Tough. Yeah. I think it's great for baseball to see some of this. Even the Pirates, they're in the Brewers division, which I'm obviously a fan of. I don't even mind it because, you know what, it's, it's the small market clubs that are actually rising up to the top now, and I'm, I'm really enjoying this. It'll be a fun October and uh, playoff push here on out. Talk about the good. How about the biggest disappointment? A few good candidates uh, that could be on this list. There are plenty of good candidates. I unfortunately will take my Detroit Tigers. Sure. Uh, a couple of games out of first place, still with a chance to try and get back in it. But this is a team after the signing of Prince Fielder and with Justin Verlander, Max Scherzer, Miguel Cabrera, kind of the core that they had built around. Uh, a lot of people seem to think they could win 90 plus games, uh, 95 games, easily run away with the division. Absolutely. And uh, they've struggled in road games, they struggled in one run games, and uh, you know, for what was anticipated of them at the start of the year, I think they have to be one of the biggest disappointments. In fairness, I think the teams uh, in that division have overperformed. You look at the White Sox, who would have thought they would have mm -hmm. you know, been where they're at? So, I mean, they looked at the Tigers coming into this year and they said, they're going to be good, but also because of a product of their division, yeah. which yeah. you can't say that now, because the White true. Sox have That's, really stepped up. That's true. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to say the Tigers, especially coming from the other side. You know, I'm a, I'm a White Sox fan, so I'm, I'm kind of glad I was able to say that. But I'm going to go with the Dodgers. Um, we talked once again at the previous, you know, the last show of the season last year, and it just they had, a, they had definitely a chance to take the West. They had a chance to take the wild card. And then pulling off a trade that really no one has ever kind of seen before, that kind of money going. 
you would think they would at least pull together, but they just can't get it going. The chemistry is not there. It's just a team that it seems like a team that's like every Dodgers team every year. They have promise most of the time, and they just can't get over that hump. That was a lot of manufactured hype, though. You had the new ownership stepping in. You had the trade for Hanley Ramirez. You had the Adrian Gonzalez. They brought over half the Red Sox, yeah. it seemed like, to the L.A. I mean, a lot of manufactured hype, but again, like you said, it hasn't come to fruition. Yeah. I mean, the last couple of weeks have been a very good uh, sample size of what the L.A. Dodgers are really about, and they have a good chance of being out of the, out of the playoff race when it uh, hits October. Uh, we'll leave it on that note. Uh, we'll step aside for one final timeout. On the other side, our quick hit section. Uh, you won't want to miss it. You're watching Valpo Sports Night. Stay tuned. I'm Matthew Barnard and I'm on VU TV. I'm Vince Liuto and I'm on VU TV. I'm Becky Vinema and I'm on VU TV. Hi, I'm Professor Powell. And I'm Lauren Whitney Gotbreath. And, and you're on, on VU TV. Hi, I'm Michael Graves and I'm on VU TV. Hi, I'm Pastor Jim and I'm on VU TV. We're Voobox and we're on VU TV. I'm Logan Cohen and I'm on VU TV. Hi, I'm Veronica Heckler and I'm on VU TV. Hey, I'm Kevin Deitch, and I'm on VU TV. Back into Valpo Sports Night for our final segment, our quick hit section of the program. Again, Andrew and Colin joining me. With another NHL lockout looming, which side is to blame, guys? Owners. Um, I mean, when you yeah. ask players to basically take a step back into the 1960s, they're asking 27% sales cut, I mean, uh, you know, salary cut. They're asking that they have to be 28 before they reach free agency. They're asking five year maximum contracts. That's just a lot without giving too much. I just, I just don't see how it's going to work. Yeah, I mean, I agree with the owners. They let spending get out of control and giving Ilya Kovalchuk like 17-year deal. Zach Parisi <laughs> gets 11, right. a 13-year deal out of Minnesota. But at the same time, the player's a little bit to blame when you look at it going, they know what has happened already once before. The 2004-2005 season was lost. And should they give in all the owner demands? No, but they need to start backing down a little bit with the realization that Hockey has definitely decreased in popularity in the U.S., and they cannot afford another prolonged lockout or the money that they're counting on from TV or fans or whatever just isn't going to be there. Yeah. All right, moving on. National starter Steven Strasburg has been shut down for the year. Is this the right move if you're the Nationals? No. No? No, absolutely not. Um, I understand the need to protect his arm in the hopes that he can lead you to multiple World Series titles. But there are no guarantees that the Nationals are ever going to be in this position again. You would like to think so, Absolutely. and uh, you know their general manager Rizzo would like to think that you know they can get there year after year. But when you're this close, when you have the best record in baseball, and you've got one of the best arms in baseball, I say let it ride. And sure. if he's pitching in Game 7 of the World Series and his elbow explodes, but you win the World Series, he's won the World Series, you've brought a championship to, and people will say, well, you shouldn't have done that, but they wouldn't have been in the World Series perhaps Absolutely. otherwise. They've still got a good rotation, but I don't know if they're clearly the favorites in the National League without him. And I say, while it's there, you got to go for it. It's a tough s subject to really get on because you, you're dealing with multiple things. He's young. He has Tommy John surgery. I'm going to have to agree, though. You just have to, you have to go for it. I would like to see something a little bit in between. Maybe him throw, not shut down altogether. Maybe he gets one or two more starts for the rest of the season. You do some bullpen sidearm testing. So then you bring him in for the playoffs. I just don't understand the need, especially when you've had so many years of just terrible, terrible seasons. Washington finally has something to get behind, and now you just, you're going to take what arguably is your ace and just say, we're done. That's kind of like almost throwing in the towel. I think they're just stubborn. Management said put this 160 innings limit at the beginning of the season, and in order to keep their word, they were going to do this no matter what, which to me is silly. I think, like Andrew said, if you got a chance to win it or go yep. deep into the postseason, you got to do it. I, I look back to 08 when the Brewers acquired CeCe Sabathia. Yeah, we gave them half the minor leagues, our, half our minor league system, but 
you look back, you know what, you got to the postseason. That's, that's all that matters, and you give up whatever you need to do to make it to the postseason, even if it's risking uh, Steven Strasburg's health in the future. Really quickly, guys, last thing, uh, we didn't touch on college football too much. Uh, what was the biggest upset in week one? I think Oregon State against Wisconsin. Um, I thought Wisconsin had a, you know, a good chance to win the Big Ten to go to, you know, contend for a national championship game. And Oregon State, you know, they've had off and on success, but overall I think that was the biggest one. I think it has to be Louisiana Monroe over Arkansas. Sun Belt team beating a team from the SEC, a team that was thought to be able to challenge with the return of uh, Niall Davis, their running back, for the SEC West, maybe knock off Alabama and LSU, and uh, now knocked out of the national title, and I think that's got to be the biggest one. All right, we'll wrap things up there. I want to thank Colin Terrell, VU TV Assistant Sports Director, and Andrew Stem, two familiar faces here uh, on Valpo Sports.